Hey guys, hi, how are you? Today we're here to talk about the mystery of why are new cars so expensive. I want to talk about vehicle inflation on new cars and why it seems like vehicles seem to be more expensive than ever. Here's what I found, but first let's talk about MSRP because it will be the point of reference for every new car purchased. And because every transaction is unique, I can only base my argument on MSRP and not on individual experiences based on particular trends and market conditions. The MSRP or manufacturer suggested retail price plays a very significant role in the automotive industry. In the 1950s, a senator by the name of Mike Mangroni sponsored the Automobile Information Disclosure Act of 1958. This legislation mandated that car manufacturers and dealers disclose a vehicle cost and features to consumers. The term MSRP emerged as a result of this law and it stands for the price that manufacturers recommend a dealer to sell a car for. Commonly known as a sticker price, it's usually displayed on the window sticker of a car via the Monroney sticker. And it's important to understand the MSRP because it serves as a starting point of negotiation with the dealer. It's higher than the invoice price, which is a fixed amount that dealerships pay the manufacturers for a car and dealers can receive other incentives from automakers which may reduce the actual cost of the cars they purchase. Keep in mind that the MSRP doesn't include things like dealership installed options that are usually displayed on another sticker on the side of the MSRP window sticker and that usually includes things like window tinting, wheel locks and other things that just inflate the price of the car. Dealers are often willing to offer discounts, low interest loans, cashback rebates and other pricing promotions to reduce the selling price below the MSRP. A destination charge, also known as the delivery charge or freight charge, is a fee the manufacturers charge dealers for delivering the vehicle to the dealership. This fee is usually non-negotiable and is separate from the MSRP. But it seems like there's always a difference between what the MSRP of a vehicle says and what people actually pay for a car, especially nowadays. And it seems like the prices for new cars have skyrocketed in recent years. So let's talk about new vehicle inflation. And according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, the prices for new cars have surged significantly over the years. As of 2024, new cars are 756.37% higher in price compared to 1935. This means that if a car cost $15,000 back in 1935, an equivalent purchase in 2024 will save you back around $128,000. The average annual inflation rate for new cars during this period was approximately 2.44%. But here's the catch. The price of a new car in 1935 was not $15,000, but a mere $853, which adjusted to inflation would be a little shy of $20,000. And the average price for a new car as of January of this year is more than twice that amount at $44,000. And here's a list of some of the vehicles that $20,000 can buy you these days. But let's change the dates of historic inflation a little bit to help you relate to what I am talking about. According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, prices for new vehicles have experienced an average inflation rate of 1.99% per year between 1988 and 2023. And I say 1988 because it is the year that my 1989 BMW 325 was sold for the first time. The MSRP of my 3 Series was $27,500, which adjusted to inflation will be about $72,000 in today's money. But let's see how much a brand new 3 Series runs for these days. The most basic 3 Series has an MSRP of $44,500. So the bad news is that new car prices are really high, but the good news is that the price of new cars have not kept up with inflation. But I want to bring you an even more relatable example of how cars are cheaper now than they were then. And in my search, I struggled to find models that would be comparable like apples are to apples because Cars have evolved so much over the years that the same nameplate doesn't necessarily mean that it is the same vehicle anymore. Take for instance the Mustang. The Mustang nameplate is now stuck to uh, an electric SUV. Or for example the Ford Explorer which is a unibody construction. It used to be a body on frame in the 90s. But if you keep digging into the past, before it was an SUV, it used to be a truck in the 70s. Yes, the Ford Explorer was a pickup. The original Honda Accord used to be a lot smaller, but by 1989, it was pretty similar to what it is today, a mid-size sedan. 
The 1989 Honda Accord was the first Accord to be built in the United States and it continues to be built here. In 1989, the MSRP of the base Honda Accord was $14,180, which adjusted to inflation is $35,487. But the base Accord today it starts at only almost $28,000 or over 21% less. And the new Accord is bigger, almost twice as powerful, nearly 30% more fuel efficient, and is packed with options and safety features that were obviously not available back in 1989. So it's a lot more car for a lot less. Meanwhile, the top of the line 1989 Honda Accord SEI sedan had an MSRP of almost $18,000, which is about 21% more than the base model DX. Fast forward to 2024 and between the base Honda Accord and the top of the line, which as of today will be the Honda Accord Touring Hybrid, which MSRP is for about $39,000. There's a difference of about $11,000 or 28%. So as you can see, the gap between the base and the top of the line models has widened throughout the years by 7%. But again, the pinnacle version of the Accord is packed with features that make it just sport car to include a powertrain that is hybrid, which enables the car to give you 44 miles per gallon of combined driving, which is about 42% more fuel efficient than it was back in 1989. So again, are cars more expensive now than they were back in the late 80s? Let's see. In 1988, the real per capita income in the United States was about $13,000 and the MSRP of a new base 3 series was $27,500. In 2023, the natural average income was about $59,000 and the price of a new 3 series was around what it is today at $44,500. So technically, we make more money now in relation to the cost of a new car. So why does it feel like we don't? I have a theory and I'm not an economist the cost of living which is affected by the inflation in the housing market. In 1988, the average cost of a home in the United States was about $112,000, which adjusted to inflation today would be about $300,000, but the median price of a home in 2023 was $412,000. So as you can see, while we have the perception that new car prices have increased dramatically, which they have, don't take me wrong, the average price of a new car has not kept up with inflation and it has definitely not been able to keep up with real estate inflation. In fact, as of late, Americans have been hit by all kinds of inflation. For example, nationwide fast food prices have risen 29.4% since 2020. Prices shot up by 25 cents. A quarter may not seem like a lot, but let's look at the big picture. Customers across the nation have already been dealing with a 30% spike in fast food prices since 2020. During the pandemic, new vehicle sales initially declined due to layoffs and economic uncertainty, but by the spring of 2021, they had recovered and even surpassed pre-pandemic levels. Recently, sales have yo-yo due to supply constraint and low dealer inventories. According to MarketWatch, prices on new cars are expected to drop in 2024 as the industry industry moves beyond the supply chain issues that pushed up out of prices during the pandemic. But in my opinion, another driver of vehicle prices is the American taste in automobiles, which has drifted from sedans in the 80s to SUVs as of late. In fact, looking at a list of the most popular vehicles throughout the 80s, the winner of each year was either a sedan or a coupe. And shockingly, out of a list of the most popular vehicles in sales volume in the United States for 2023, listed by car and driver, only five were sedans and the rest were either trucks or SUVs. And these SUVs, the vast majority were car based. And SUVs are just more expensive than their sedan counterparts. That is, SUVs that are built on car platforms that sell for more than a vehicle in the sedan form based on the same platform. Take for instance the example of the TNG AK platform. It underpins many Toyota unibody vehicles, but we're only gonna focus on two, the Lexus ES and the Lexus RX. And to keep the comparison fair, we're only gonna use the comparable base models without all-wheel drive. The most basic Lexus ES, a sedan, starts at about $43,000, and the bare-bones Lexus RX, a crossover, starts at nearly $50,000. So that's about $7,000 in difference between the two vehicles that are nearly identical underneath the sheet metal. And I am sorry if I couldn't find any data about the cost to produce these two vehicles, but my guess is that their cost to manufacture is similar, if not the same. And one can argue that certain features in an SUV make it a better vehicle for everyday use. But again, SUVs have been widely available since the 90s, yet they were never our vehicle of choice. And somehow we ended up in this frenetic affair with SUVs, which consume more gas, handle worse, are louder and more expensive to own due to things like bigger tires. So companies are able to get more money out of us for the same car in slightly different shape 
and these are not necessarily more expensive to manufacture than sedans and coupes based on the same platforms. So who is there to blame? Or sales or car companies? And I am guilty of that because my last three new vehicles have been SUVs, but I can say that I use them in a different way that I would use a sedan. Now I wanna share with you something that I read on an article from The Guardian from 2020. It says, Harvey Miller, professor and director of the Center for Urban and Regional Analysis at Ohio State University said, these SUVs are named after mountains and other places that you'll never go to. They created a market that pushes our buttons. They are, speaking about SUVs, fundamentally inefficient. You're taking a 200 pound package, a human, and wrapping it up in a 6,000 pound shipping container, he said. For some reason, we think that this is a good way to move through a city. If Amazon used that rationale, it would be out of business in a week. So there you have it. Yes, new vehicles are more expensive now than when I was back in high school, but they haven't kept up with inflation. And one can say that it is cheaper to manufacture cars now as production of automobiles and their components have moved in part to places and countries with cheaper labor costs and that production lines are way more efficient now than they were 35 years ago. But new vehicles now are built with safety features that drive up the price of production. They also have very expensive technology features that affect the cost to build. And I'd be lying to you if I told you that I feel like we need all the giant screens and the gadgets that we demand in new vehicles today. New car prices have gone up due to a change in taste for the types of vehicles that we want to drive, especially in the United States, which are SUVs today. But also because of the safety features that vehicles must have due to regulation, sometimes for unlikely accident scenarios and the technology gadgets that we demand manufacturers to put in the vehicles we buy. Let me know in the comments if you enjoy this format of videos from me. I really enjoy doing the research, putting these videos together because I learn a lot myself in the process, but I also know that these types of videos don't get me a lot of views. If you enjoy watching this video, one way that you can help me is by liking the video, making comments, asking tons of questions, and of course, by subscribing to my channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.